Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in to Crossings, a ministry of Calvary Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Dwight Lapine, and I'll be your host this morning as we get started in teaching you what the Bible says, not only about eternal life, but how to get to know God daily, moment by moment, in a personal way. We trust that this connection would really help you have a peace and a joy as you come to know Him and believe in Him. to have you take your Bible right now and turn with me to Job chapter 11. I know my granddaughter told me that this is not the type of message you should be preaching for a New Year's Eve or New Year's Day service. Job, Zophar, and Paul. What kind of message is that for New Year's Day? You should have something about purpose, something about direction, not Job, Zophar, and Paul. Well, we'll be starting a new series, of course, next week when we talk about discipleship and exercising yourself to godliness. But I want to complete this. I want to finish this. And today is the last man, Zophar. And we'll be talking about the voice of wisdom and reason with Zophar. And again, just to give you some background once again, Job had a very blessed life. All of the days of Job were fantastic, blessed by God, except for this one period of time. It's not a very long period of time. Compared to all the years that he had prior to the testation, testing and the temptation and all the days that he had after that temptation, he had a very short period of testing. But it was extremely painful. The greatest testing over a period of time that you could imagine. When you lose your family, you can lose all of your possessions, you lose your health. And I'm not sure what's making that noise. Is that better? We'll find out. Okay, anyway, he lived a incredibly blessed life except for that really difficult time in the middle. Job had three friends, and these three friends were not shy in sharing their opinion. Eliphaz, again, was the voice of experience. I have seen Job, and he would explain about, about tradition and what Job should have also seen about how God deals with people who are sinful. Bildad was the voice of tradition, the voice of antiquity. We talked about Bildad and how this man talked about the ancients and what the ancients would say. And just think about them. They were the men with wisdom. They were the men that had grown up. And Job, if he would just listen to that, he would understand what God is doing in his life. Now today, again, the voice of wisdom and reason. Talk about logic. Zophar is the voice of reason. And Zophar is going to be speaking about intellectually about what wisdom should say to Job. Now having said that, we took three different men. We brought from Eliphaz, again, we introduced him to James. And James was the half-brother of Jesus. Now if you can imagine, you can't get any more experience than being the half-brother of Jesus Christ. He was raised in the same home with the same parents that Jesus had. He had all of the experiences of seeing Jesus as he was being brought up and all of that experience and tradition of the Jewish people. And so, of course, James talks about tradition and he talks about the, the, the patience that Job has learned. And what we come to understand with James is Job was given an incredible gift. The gift that he was given, again, was a gift of patience, a gift of suffering that was the greatest thing that probably happened in Job's life. When you talk about Job later on in the book of James, you don't talk about you have heard of the wealth of Job. You talk about you've heard of the patience of Job. The greatest possession that Job has, he received from the temptation and the trials. We talked about Bildad and we introduced him to Peter. And Peter said to, to Bildad, he said to, to Job, Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial which has come upon you. Some, some strange things happen to you. You have become a partaker of the suffering of Jesus Christ. You think about Eliphaz earlier saying that, when, when, when has an innocent person ever suffered? Think about any innocent person suffering. And of course, Jesus Christ was innocent, and he suffered. Eliphaz was wrong. Bildad was wrong. 
Zophar comes with this voice of wisdom and reason, and we're going to bring Paul into the situation to talk about Zophar because Paul says an awful lot about wisdom. But before we get there again, by way of introduction, I said to you two weeks ago, <coughs> and I'll say it to you again, Job was a perfect and an upright man, one that feared God and eschewed or hated evil. God said that about Job. Job was a perfect man, an upright man. Job was saved. Job had a Savior. He knew that his Redeemer lived and that he would stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job was a saved man. But Job had heard of God by the hearing of the ear. When you talk about Job, Job is not the kind of person to see the beam in his own eye. That's not Job. Job could see no beam in his own eye. He saw nothing that he had done that would deserve this suffering. And of course, Jesus Christ, he tells all of us that there's a beam in our eye. There's motes in people's eye, yes, but there's beams in our own eye. When Job had had an opportunity to actually know God, to see God, to stand before God, he said, I abhor myself. I repent in sackcloth and ashes. Job had a totally different understanding of who he was, who he was after he had had an opportunity to meet the Lord. Job meets God in Job chapter 38, and he says, I've heard of thee of the hearing ear, but now my eye sees you. Now again, I just want you to understand that God wants more for us than just to hear about him by the hearing of ear. There's an awful lot of church people who come and hear about God, and they know God based upon the word of God. They know God by hearing about him. They may have put their trust in him. But they don't have that close walk that God wants for us that's more than just hearing about him. God has something more for the church than just hearing about God on Sunday mornings. God wants us to have a relationship with him, to know him as his heart, to know God's passion, to know his holiness, to know his, his righteousness, to know what that means. I'll say this in Sunday school later on, but again, you can imagine when, when, when Matthew 6.33 says, but seek ye first God. No, he doesn't say that. As difficult that is to understand, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added to you. There are some things that God is really passionate about. He's passionate about his kingdom. He's passionate about righteousness. We may hear about him, but to understand his heart, to understand his passion, to know the things that God wants us to seek, that's critically important. But my eye sees you. That's what we really want. And of course, when we look at the book of... The reason I want to conclude with this is this is a really a good way of, of coming into the year 2017 to think about more than just hearing about God, to know him not as a person, but know him, his person. Job 11, 6 now, if we would take and turn to Job chapter 11, I asked you to turn to there already, and I'm the one that did not turn there, so let me get started here real quickly. Job chapter 11. And I will make sure that I don't read from Psalm chapter 11 this morning. We'll get into Job. Job chapter 11, verse 1. Then answered Zophar the Namathite and said, should not the multitude, multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? Should your lies make men hold their peace? And when you mock, shall not men make thee ashamed? For you have said, my doctrine is pure. I'm clear in the, clean in my, thine eyes. Oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee. That he would show thee the secrets of wisdom. That they are double to that which is Know therefore that God exacts of thee less than your iniquity deserves. Now again, you can understand, we said here, he's going to talk about wisdom. You can see that real clearly. He says again in verse 16, Oh, that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom. This is a man that has the secrets of wisdom. And he's going to explain to Job what wisdom is all about. And I just want you to know right away, it is not 
impossible to find out God by wisdom. You're not going to comprehend God by human wisdom. Human wisdom is never going to be sufficient to understand the workings of God. I'll give you some illustrations. Ecclesiastes 8.17 is written by whom? Solomon. I beheld the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. Because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it. Yea, rather, though a wise man think he know it, yet he will not be able to find it. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon says, I was great. I increased more than all that were before me. My wisdom remained in me. He was the wisest of all men. Whatever my eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. Then I looked on all my works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I labored to do, and behold, it was vanity. It was vanity. It was empty. It was meaningless. It was vexation of spirit. Even with all my wisdom that God had given to me, the work that I tried to do with my wisdom ended up being empty to me. It had no purpose, no meaning, no passion before God. Folks, faith is just plain not logical. Now let me, let me explain that. It is logical to God. In eternity, it will be logical. But it's not going to fit our human reasoning, our logic. Faith does not parallel to my human reasoning or thinking. 1 Corinthians 1.21, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. The world is trying to figure out God by wisdom. And when God does not fit wisdom, then the world throws God away and says he doesn't exist. Because in my wisdom, in my logic, I cannot find God in that wisdom. Therefore, I dismiss the fact of God because it doesn't fit my wisdom. But it's foolishness. The world looks at it and says, this is foolish. And all of you that believe in this are foolish. You're fools. Because you're not logical. And again, you think of how God dealt with these people. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness unto him. <coughs> Say it to you again. The workings of God is not a business model. <laughs> it's not a business model. God does not deal in a church based on the bottom line. It's not about pragmatism. You can think how God dealt with the other men in the Bible when he sent the, the disciples two by two. Don't take any money with you. Don't take a purse or a wallet. Don't take any money. And in the homes that you enter into, they will take care of you. Yeah, really? But I'm not going to tell you who those people are. <laughs> You're going to figure that one out on your own. But I want you to do this. And they'll take care of you. Not exactly a business model. Okay, we just start here again with, with Noah. Noah's an interesting one. Okay, Noah, I want you to build a boat. I know what a boat is. I can build a boat. Boat is about three times longer than this church. Three times longer than the church. 600 feet. This is 200 feet. Six, three times longer than this. Two football fields. No, no. Two, no two thirds of a football field. 600 feet. What is a football field? It's 300 feet. So it's two, two football fields. I got to get my math right here. I, I was good at math at one time, a long time ago. Okay, so you have these two football fields. That is a huge boat. But Noah's going to build it in a desert. It has never rained on the earth before Noah. There's never been a drop of rain on the earth before Noah. Once you build this building, this ark, how are you going to move it? Just look at this building here. How are you going to move this thing? All we got to do is take this building and move it to the ocean. Okay? You're going to help me to this afternoon. We're going to move this building to the ocean. How are you going to move it? And the people who came by Noah, who looked at Noah, said, Noah, you are a fool. 
This is crazy. There's absolutely no logic in what you're doing here. And now you're going to take two of every kind of animal and you're going to put them in that boat? How are you going to do that? How are you going to round up those animals? And how are you going to feed them? No, those animals are all over the place. And Noah, Noah gives 120 years of his life to this project. 120 years of his life to this project. I want you to consider what it's like for God to say to Gideon, I want you to take a clay jar and I want you to put a light in it, a lantern in it, and I want you to take a trumpet and 300 men and I want you to defeat an army of 100,000. Would you do that for me? Again, humanly speaking, there's no logic involved with that. And so when we go about to try to do something, and I'm sorry, this is, this is popping and cracking today. I'm not exactly sure why it's doing that. But when we go about trying to do what God wants us to do on this earth, and he asks us to build something, he asks us to do something, he asks us to call on someone, we have to be very careful that we don't have human reasoning tell us what is correct and what is true. The world by wisdom knew not God. Here's Zophar, the youngest of the three, probably the youngest of the three because he's the last one. Eliphaz and Bildad mention, have three discourses. Zophar only has two discourses. But he is by far the harshest of the three. He calls Job a liar. He calls him a babbler. He calls him a mocker, one who mocks. With Zophar, everything is logical. Zophar is saying something like this. Job, God never makes a mistake. You are being punished. Don't blame God. God is righteous. God never makes mistakes, which means what? If he's punishing you, you deserve the punishment. Job, it's just logical. You have a dog? How many of you have a dog? Okay. If your dog fails to obey you, what do you do? You scold him? How many scold him? Okay, does he understand the word no? Does your dad no, no? You remember the far side comic? <laughs> I just got a kick out of it. You stupid dog, Brandy. Brandy, you never learn anything. Brandy, I'm going to send you to the, the kennel. Brandy, I'm through with you. And all the dog hears is blah, 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 Brandy, blah, Brandy, blah, 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 Brandy. <laughs> That's all the dog knows. The dog has absolutely no idea what you just said to him, you know. So what do you do with your dog? It's logical. When he sits, when you tell him to sit, you give him a treat. When he comes, when you tell him to come, you give him a treat. When he doesn't come, you scold him, you put him in the kennel, you may even slap him or spank him because your dog has to learn. It's just logical, right? You treat your dog that way, why would you expect God to do anything different? It is logical. This is what Alfred Barnes says about Zophar. Zophar spoke third in offering advice to Job. Zophar's speech begins in chapter 11, giving the strongest of the three initial speeches. He declares that Job deserves even worse than he got. Know then that God ex exacts of you less than your guilt deserves. His second speech focuses on the theme that the one who commits wickedness will suffer for it. In his words, a flood will carry off his house, rushing waters on the day of God's wrath. Such is the fate God allows to, lots to the wicked. Now, having said that, you're a talker, you're a babbler, Job 11 too. Should not the multitude of the words be answered? Should a man full of talk be justified? Know therefore that God exacts of thee less than your iniquities deserve. Okay, stop for a minute. Is he right? Do you deserve more punishment than you're receiving from God? Do you deserve to go to hell? Yes. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not debating that. Ezra, listen to what Ezra says. 
after all that has come upon us for evil deeds and for our great trespasses, seeing that, that our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve, God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve. Psalm 103.10, he hath not dealt with us after our sins. If he would, Psalm 130, verse 3, if thou, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? You, you get these presidential election years, and you get these candidates that are squeaky clean, and they come be before the scrutiny of the press, and they're not squeaky clean anymore. As a matter of fact, there's not one politician that you just don't say, yuck after you see what they dig up about them. <coughs> the politicians are full of sin. They're full of corruption. They're full of lies. And it's just, they have these, after each debate, they find a who lied more. Don't you love that? This one lied 60 times. This one lied 152 times. Wonderful. I want to vote for the one who lied less. Don't you? Wonderful to vote for the one who lied only 60 times. You know, they start putting you through scrutiny, but think about it. If God would to do, were to do that with you, with me. See, it's not the, the politicians have done things outwardly, but what about what you've done inwardly that God knows about that no one else does? If God were to mark the iniquity of your heart, what you think in your mind, what you think in your heart, what would, what would happen to you if God would mark iniquity? Would you be able to stand before him? Yes, it is true. <laughs> we deserve a whole lot more than that. But we are glad that he hath not dealt with us after our sins. He hath not rewarded us according to our iniquities. And friends, that is not why Job is suffering. It is logical. Job is a sinner like everyone else. Job goes under the same temptations that Zophar does. Zophar knows the temptations in his heart. There's no logical reason why Job wouldn't be going through those same temptations. Zophar is right. But that's not why Job is suffering. That's not why God is doing this. There's a different reason. Canst thou by searching find out God? Can you find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is high as heaven. You can't not thou do deeper than hell. You cannot know. Here's Job's response. <laughs> I get a kick out of this response. Job says, no doubt that you're a people and wisdom will die with you. But I have understanding as well as you. I'm not inferior to you. Who doesn't know such things as thee? You now Job is not saying that, Jophar, what you're saying is wrong. He is saying, what you're saying is wrong in my case. That's not why I'm suffering. I do know that pe people are sinful. I know that we deserve more than we're getting. I know we deserve punishment. But that's not why I'm, why I'm suffering. Job will go on and show all these wicked people that are living great lives. They die with great abundance. He'll show that this is just plain not logical so far. But what he's saying to Zophar here is, you're, you don't have a corner on the market of truth. You're not giving me anything I don't know already. Zophar's second discourse is found in Job 20. He says, Knowest thou this of old, since man was placed on the earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short. And he says, look at Job. You've had all of these years where you were wealthy, where you had all of these blessings, but that is going to end because of your wickedness. You thought it would go forever, but because of your wickedness, it's coming to an end. The triumphing of the wicked is short. It will not endure forever. So far, second discourse, God is always right. That means whatever God's doing is right. It's a righteous thing for Job to suffer. You've heard it. The boss is always right. Number two, when the boss is wrong, refer back to number one. The boss is always right. That's what God is like. God is always right. He's always righteous. He's always holy. Don't worry about it. Now let's bring Paul into the situation before we have communion. Let's bring Paul in. Let's see if we can get some of the wisdom of God on this subject. First of all, your faith does not stand in man's wisdom or speech. 
And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. My speech and my preaching was not enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit. And notice this word, power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom, but power. There's a difference between the way God deals with man and the way wisdom is. The world by wisdom cannot find power. They will not find power to overcome evil. They will not find power to change. They will not find power to change this world. It does not exist. I'll tell you what. There were only about 20 people here last night for that movie, Woodlawn, but it was fantastic. If you get a chance, it is a really motivational movie it's a, or a film, Christian film, and it's of an incredible uh, true story that took place in a, in a high school down in Alabama, and I'd really love to have you take a look at it. It was a great, great message last night. Your faith does not stand in man's wisdom. The wisdom of the world will come to nothing. The wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. I want you to notice this, that suffering like wisdom is a present tense problem. Suffering is not eternal. There is no suffering for a Christian who knows Christ in heaven. There is no suffering for you eternally. That is not true for an unsaved person, but it is true for you. Suffering is a present tense situation, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, there's an exceeding eternal weight of glory that's connected to every suffering. Suffering is a package, if it's opened up, contains glory. The package is a present tense package, but when it's opened up, it will include an eternal glory that will be revealed in us. My wife had devotions this morning from Paul David Tripp, and she just shared one thought with me this morning when she was reading her devotions. And Paul David Tripp just said, it is the least natural thing for mankind, the least natural thing is for us to seek the glory of another. I want you to consider that. It's the least natural thing for man to seek the glory of another. The most natural thing for man is to seek his own glory. And we wake up in the morning <laughs> and one of the first things that comes to us naturally is our own glory. How can I receive glory today? That is a natural part of mankind. It is really, really foreign to mankind to seek the glory of another, to work for the glory of another. I want you to understand this, that Paul is very similar to Job in a number of ways. Job lost all of his family. Paul was never given a family. Paul never had children. Job's children were given to him, taken from him, but they were in heaven. Job never lost those children. Paul was never given children. Paul's sufferings, henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks. It was like boils all over this man's body. Paul was stoned for his faith, and the rocks that hid him put marks all over him. His flesh was torn to such an extent that when you looked at Paul, his face was disfigured, his arms were disfigured, he bore in his body the marks of the Lord Jesus. As the sufferings of Christ abound in us, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, Paul had an incredible amount of suffering that he endured for a moment of time that was equivalent to the type of suffering that Job went through. Would you agree? He says, Rejoice in my sufferings for you, the Philip, that which is behind you, the afflictions of Christ. One of the things that Paul says is, My afflictions are not Paul's afflictions, they're not Job's afflictions, they're Christ's afflictions. And I am carrying in my body Christ's afflictions. 
For we not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we pressed out a measure above strength, above strength, inasmuch that we despaired even of life. Now again, you compare Job, who also despaired of life, who wished he had never been born, with Paul, who also despaired of life, because the pressures that were exerted upon him were greater than he could bear. We had the sentence of death in ourselves. One of the things that Paul talks about with suffering's purpose is that, listen, folks, <laughs> that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead. What I, have, I have, what, three minutes to explain to you the purpose of suffering? <laughs> oh, that's going to work. I have three minutes to explain the purpose of suffering. In my life, every morning I wake up trusting myself. In my life, every decision I make starts out with me trusting myself. When I come to the end of myself, then I turn to the Lord and I start trusting in Him. The purpose of suffering is so that I would not trust my own wisdom, temporal wisdom. The purpose of my suffering is so I trust in the living God, eternity, in His wisdom. We cannot understand future deliverance, but we can understand it based upon past deliverance, who delivered us from so great a death, death delivering whom we trust he will deliver us. Past, present, and future is based upon what Christ has done in our life in the past. That we would have a better testimony to the world of the power of Christ. For our rejoicing is this, that the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. Now, folks, just by closing, please take your Bible and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. This is by closing by Paul. Paul, what do you think of what's going on with Job's life? Could you explain to us what's going on with Job? He's not suffering because he sins. That's not the point of Job's suffering. What is the point, Paul? And Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord three times that it might depart from me, and he said to me, and this is God's word to Paul, Paul, listen, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the purpose, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. The world in wisdom cannot understand anything going on in your life. But they can understand power. The world can see a difference in you that's not in them. That there's a power in you and that's revealed when you go through hard times. It's not revealed to you in good times. When you're at Valley Fair and the rides and you're smiling and you're laughing, the world does the same thing. But when the world is suffering and they lash out at other people, when they lash out at loved ones because they hurt and they can't get rid of their suffering, then they look upon you because there's a testimony in you that's very different than the testimony that the world feels. Because the world sees in you something that they do not have because what they see you going through, when they go through it, they can't overcome it. It's beyond their measure. But God's strength is made perfect in your weakness, and God allows you to go through suffering for an incredible purpose, for a testimony to the world about the power of Christ. When the disciples saw Jesus Christ praying, they wanted to learn how to pray. Why? Because of the power of Christ that they saw in him through his prayer life. I want that power. 
I want to be able to have the power that you have in your prayers. And that's what happens when God allows us to suffer. The world sees in us something so different. And it's very clear in this passage. I will glory in my infirmities because I want the power of Christ to rest upon me. We'll get to this in just a minute. But we're going to have a word of prayer right now. We're going to have the deacons prepare themselves for the Lord's table. And we're going to spend some time right now fellowshipping around him. When we gather before him, I don't want you to think of him with the hearing of your ear. I want you to consider who he is. And can I have a closer walk with him this week, this month, this year than I've had in the past? I want his power to rest upon me because I want my life to count for him. I want my life to be different. I want the world to see a difference inside of me so that when a man asks me the hope of the reason that's in me, they see a hope inside of me and they want to know why there's a hope inside of me. I have an answer for them. I want to thank you for tuning into our program. It's been a delight to have you. I trust that you understand a little bit more about what Jesus Christ did for you when he died on the cross. Salvation is not something that you receive because you're born into a family or because you go to church or because you're good. Salvation is a free gift, but that gift has to be received. If you have not received it, we'd like to have you take some time to talk to God and ask Him that He might be your Savior. You understand that you are a sinner, that Jesus Christ died for you, and that you can know that you have eternal life by putting your trust in Christ today.